This is Road Noise, episode number 40. Six ways to earn extra income from home. Hello again and welcome to Road Noise, life one mile at a time. I'm your host, Michael Blackston. You're sitting alongside me in the passenger seat as I make my commute to Cookville, Tennessee this morning. If you're hearing the sound of a rumble under my voice, it's just the sound of the road, hence the reason I call it road noise. And we're going to learn to live life one mile at a time. And in this episode, I'm going to tell you about six ways that I've learned through research that you can make some extra money. Uh, Some of them I'm involved with myself. Uh, One of them I have made a little extra money and some other ones that I'm thinking about doing. And so I want to pass these along to you. I know if if you're like me, it's not quite enough to have the job and income that I have. I mean, I'm happy. I'm very happy with what I do. I run my own company. I know that for most folks, that's not the case. But even though I run my own company and the money is good and my wife's working now and we have that income, I always find reasons that I could use a little more. And because I don't need to take a second job, and because personally I don't want to work for anybody else, jobs that I can do and ways to make money from home are very interesting to me. And so I've done a lot of research in that area, and I want to pass my knowledge along to you as little as it may be. I have not become anywhere near an expert in any of these situations, but I think by giving you just these little nuggets, these six little items, some of them may be interesting enough for you to go ahead and do the extra research to find out. And there are a few of them that I have a little bit more defined information for you because I've done the research myself, and I'll get to those and, uh, and, and tell you as much as I can about them. So the first one I want to talk about is mainly going to be for artists you might consider selling your art prints. There are websites like Etsy.com, E-T-S-Y, and you've probably heard of Cafe Press, and I've even sold some prints on eBay. If you have art prints that are unique to you, that you have the right to sell the images for, you might have a market there. Now, the most profitable one that I have found has been eBay for me. But that's mainly because it has really taken the least effort to make the sales. You can make money on Etsy, but there's work that you have to do. And I didn't say this at the beginning. Uh, The first two of these are going to be active income. And the second, the next four, three through six, are going to be passive income. And let me tell you the difference, although it's probably pretty self-explanatory if you know what active income and passive mean. Active income is something that, yes, you can do it from home, but you're not done. It's not enough just to put your information out on the internet and leave it and just watch the money coming in. There's more that you have to do. That's what these first two are about. Passive income is where you create a product or a service, you put it out there, and then you sit back. Now, I do want to say that there's never really a truly fully passive income. There's always work that has to be done and with passive income there's usually a lot more work that has to be done on the front end. You really bust your butt most of the time with a successful passive income. You bust your butt on the front end. I mean you really work crazy hard to get the product ready to go but the beauty of it is once you've done that with a passive income you then put it up for sale and you wait for the money to come in if it's something that if you've done your homework and you've done the work right if it's something that will sell then when the sales come in there's not really a whole lot you have to do after that and that's what makes it a passive income once the product is created there's not really a whole lot more to do but there is more to do it's not going to be something that is you never do any work. But I'll get into that when I get to the passive income. These first two, like I said, are active income. And as I was telling you, selling art prints has worked for me in the past. Now, I stopped because I was doing something that 
it wasn't illegal and it wasn't trademark infringement but it was so close to the line I decided I didn't want to rock the boat I didn't want to test it I didn't want to go up against major corporations and companies that really have more resources to make my life miserable than I had to defend myself so I'll tell you what I was doing I came up with four images when I first started doing the etching that I do on my own and started my own company I needed a little extra income at that time because my wife wasn't working and I was the only income and I was just building the business so my clientele wasn't as boisterous as it is now I needed to add some extra stuff so what I would do is I would find granite countertop material which is about an inch and a quarter thick it's heavy and I would break it up and interesting shapes would come out of breaking it up and then I would etch something on those shapes and then go to a place in Anderson South Carolina called the Jockey Lot it was a huge flea market and I would sell these etchings as for as much as I could it was a discount place so I didn't sell them for a whole lot but I would sell them for as much as I could on the weekends and get a little extra income a little spending money a little folding money and um, you know that's usually what we use to go out on Saturday nights with my family and stuff like that so that it didn't tip uh, dip into the income that I was earning from the job well when I was doing that one of the things I would do to garner interest in my etchings was to etch while I was there to make people stop and watch and people love to watch me do it and there was one job that I did I got a big 18 by 18 piece of granite countertop material and I put it on an easel and I started just etching this montage for my wife it was gonna be a gift for her it had a Clemson tiger on it or a Bengal tiger you know the orange tiger with the black stripes it had an image of Howard's Rock which is an iconic monument that all of the players touch before every home game they'll touch the rock and then run down the hill and I had Howard's Rock on there and then I had the Clemson Tiger paw now the paw was a standard paw that a lot of teams use it didn't have some of the little intricate details in it that make it an actual Clemson Tiger paw but it was so close and it was orange which is the team's colors that eh, it was towing the line a little bit and I never put Clemson University or Clemson or anything on it there was really nothing on it other than maybe Howard's Rock that was kind of iffy and the picture I used from Howard's Rock was my own photograph of it so technically I wasn't doing anything wrong from at least anything I've been able to research but it was still there but that's okay it was one image and I had one guy come up and offer me money for it well at the time the price for that if I would have charged a monument company for it normal retail would have been about three hundred dollars this thing was in full color it was hand etched it was a nice big heavy piece and I wasn't gonna take anything less than three hundred for it because originally I did it for my wife anyway as a gift to her and she said when she was there look if somebody wants to pay you three hundred dollars for this thing sell it you know we need the money so I had that up as a backdrop and so many people came and tried to buy it for less than I wanted for it so fun one day I finally asked somebody I said look if I had a print of this image would you buy that for 20 bucks and they said absolutely so I started selling those prints at the jockey lot for 20 bucks a piece I'd find a little cheap five dollar frame at Walmart or uh, Dollar General I'd put it in the frame with a mat and it looked really nice and I'd sell it for 20 bucks and they went like hotcakes I made a lot of money doing that while I was there at the jockey lot and I had an idea to sell those online uh, just the print I would sell them for 1995 offer free shipping and not put them in a frame just the print was 1995 each one was signed hand signed by me uh, I didn't do a limited edition or anything but each one was hand signed and basically what I did was I took a good quality photograph of it and I, I say each one because once I realized those sold I did an Alabama I did a Georgia and I did a South Carolina and none of them had any trademark 
Uh, the Georgia one came close because it had a portrait of Larry Munson, who had passed and was the radio voice of the Georgia Bulldogs. And I also did a portrait of Bear Bryant on the Alabama one. And I'm going to tell you, that Alabama one sold crazy good. And so I put them on eBay for $19.95 a piece, free shipping, each one hand signed. And they sold like hotcakes. But after a while, I realized I'm touching the line so closely that if the NCAA decides they want to come down, they may have a case, they may not. And I did a lot of research and I never could find anything that would convince me that I was going to win definitely in a court case on something like that. And I didn't want to deal with cease and desists and all that stuff. So I stopped selling those on eBay. And this is a long way around to tell you, and I think it's important though so that you kind of can get the idea of where my mindset came from. And if you have something similar, maybe you can go that direction. If you have an image that is yours, maybe it's a piece of artwork, even a photograph that you think people would be interested in selling or in buying, put it on eBay. What I did when I made the photographs is I would make a good digital image of it and then I would take it to Staples or Office Depot and have them do an inkjet print on cardstock. So it was a heavy stock, a nice print. I would make I would look at each one and make sure, you know, that they knew I needed them to be straight and I just get them done and they cost me 75 cents to a dollar a piece and then I sold them for 20. Now it would cost me anywhere from five, four and a half to five dollars to mail them because I would also uh, put them in bubble envelopes, I'd put them between cardboard and that's where the active and not passive income comes because if you make the sale then you have to handle it, you have to ship it. But I paid for the cost of shipping because really when it all came down to it, I lost, or I didn't lose, it cost me anywhere from five to six and a half dollars per print to mail it and have it printed. And then the rest of it was profit, which was, you know, between 10 and 13 dollars a piece that I was making every time one sold. And that's a good profit, really. I mean, you think about it. You're making uh, more than you know. Your 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 cost is six or seven bucks, and you're making ten or thirteen uh, after that. That's really good. So think about things like that. And I'm not going to tell you all the, the different places. I'm not going to list all the different places in the show notes that where you can do this. If you're interested in doing something like that, you can find places like that online. Now, you can find places that are more passive if you want to sell your art prints that they'll do everything. If you upload your digital, digital image, they'll do everything. If the customer buys it, they just pay you a commission and they do all of the shipping and handling and printing and everything. You don't do anything. And those are more passive. And you'll find those as you read the information. But if you're interested in this, just look up things like uh, Etsy.com, uh, obviously eBay, and then there are other places like that, art-specific websites where they drop ship your digital image and then they pay you a certain amount per sale. So that's number one. I'll try not to be quite so wordy in all of the rest of these because I don't want this podcast episode to go too long and I've already gone about half of what I intend to do per episode as far as lengthwise. Okay, number two, you could sell your services on uh, websites like Fiverr. Have you ever heard of Fiverr? It's spelled F-I-V-R-R dot com. And there, it, it, if you have not looked at Fiverr, it's really interesting. You can find anything from vocal impersonations that you can buy from people to sell as ringtones, people who do, imagine some, uh, say you wanted Christopher Walken to do your voicemail message. You can hire someone for $5 to do that. Well, there are all kinds of services that you can buy for $5 from people on Fiverr, but here's the kicker. They start at $5, but they offer more than that. Most of them, especially the voiceover artists, will offer more than that 
if you want to pay a little bit more, they'll give you, you know, like, for instance, if I wanted to get an intro and I'm thinking about doing that for this podcast or an, a future fo- podcast, if I wanted a voiceover artist that wasn't me so that it lended a little more credence, had a different little voice at the beginning and end, I could go on Fiverr and find somebody that gives me a sample of their work and is a professional voiceover artist and for five bucks they'll read and and produce for me an mp3 that is say a hundred words long they may say the first hundred words is five bucks if you want 200 300 you know it's this much and this much and if it's over this you can call for a quote or whatever so you can make more than five dollars per job and it's a good way to network and find future business if you have a service that you think people would pay for but it's not just legitimate stuff like that I mean I guess everything's legitimate but there's crazy stuff I mean there are people who will send glitter bombs through the mail for you for five bucks to as a practical joke for somebody I mean that it's crazy stuff if you go to fiverr.com f-i-v-r-r Dot com, you'll see what I'm talking about, and you can just browse all the different creative services people are offering for $5 and up. And it's something that you can do, too, if you think you might have something like that that would be interesting for folks. It's a neat little way to do that. Now, I would suggest it's something that you don't get tired of doing, or at least something that you enjoy doing. And I don't know that Fiverr's the only one. There might be others like that. So, it's something that you could consider doing, selling services online for amounts of money through some of these websites like Fiverr. Number three, and this starts with the passive income because the, the last one, again, active, you make the sale, then you have to per produce a good or a service. Number three begins our passive list. You can sell art prints and photography through places, like I said before, that will do everything for you. Shutterstock is one that I just joined. I have some photo artwork that I would like to sell and basically you upload your design and people buy digital copies of your artwork and you get a commission. Now, you're not going to get rich doing this. I don't guess unless you spend eight hours a day every day just constantly uploading. Like everything, the more you have in your catalog for your shop in each of these places, the more likely you are to get fined because that's more words that Google and everything can find to hit on your shop. That's called SEO. So that, you know, the more you have, the better off you are. But it's a good start and places like Shutterstock.com and others will do everything for you. I mean, I don't even think they ship anything. I think it's all digital. They may offer I'll need to look at it more. They may offer things like uh, canvas prints and things like that. I'm not sure, but you don't have to do it. With Shutterstock, you sign up and you get paid when people buy your images. And and just that's how it works. I'm not sure how all the other ones do, but Shutterstock's the only one that I have signed up for so far. Number four, write an ebook. I have done this. I have written one ebook. I'm going to completely rework it because I think the SEO and the title are wrong, and I think the cover art is wrong, and it needs to be reworked. But it's also such a weird niche that it's not likely to really sell anyway. If you write an ebook, you can sell it online very easily. There are uh, templates that you can use. You don't have to be a master. A publisher or anything like that, you can write your ebook, you can put it on something like Amazon's Kindle Direct Publishing and go from there. I will suggest if you are going to do something like write an ebook that you do your homework. I suggest that you listen to podcasts about it. I suggest you maybe contact somebody who has self published before. Uh, an ebook and find out if there are any tips and tricks and just just look it up on on the internet and find out different things that you really ought to be doing that are kind of the how to of writing an ebook but it's very easy it's just a little homework a little bit of research and you can be on your way and an ebook is a passive income that once you get it there you don't have to do anything else with it it's it's there it is Number five, you can create an online course. 
Now, this is something else that I'm seriously considering because I have expertise in a few areas of things that people tend to say, I wish I could do that. Well, when I hear somebody say, I wish I could do that more than three times, this is sort of like uh, one of the principles that is used by one of my favorite podcast hosts and authors, a man by the name of Dan Miller. He's the author of 48 Days to the Work You Love. He also has a 48 Days podcast that is a weekly podcast, and it's very encouraging, and it's for entrepreneurs, and it it really is for people who want to work for themselves or at least find the work that they love. And I have a podcast episode that I'm planning to do about how to find the work that you love, and Dan Miller will be a huge part of that. But one of his principles is if somebody mentions something to him three times as something that is needed or something they'd like to see, he considers that a possible entrepreneurial project. And that's kind of the same thing I'm thinking with this online course idea is online courses are getting bigger and bigger because people are hungry to learn. And you can make money by offering an online course that people buy, and once it's completed, they buy it, and you either ship it to them, which would be a little more active, or more likely now the way it's done is they, you know, you have it available for download through videos and and a digital text and stuff like that. And once they pay their fee, it automatically is downloaded to their computer and they can go from there. It's an online course, and I'm I'm thinking about doing two or three of them. The first one I'm thinking about doing for me is how to start a business. The Blackston Arts Way or whatever, the Blackston business model. I have a podcast episode for Road Noise coming on about that coming up pretty soon as well. So online courses, if you have some expertise or a whole lot of experience in an area that you think others would be interested in, videoing an online course is not that hard. It it sounds like you need to be an expert at videography and doing all this stuff. You really don't. There's a lot of work. This is one of them where the upfront work is heavy, heavy, heavy. If you want to do a quality product, you really need to put a lot of time into it. But if you put time and thought and planning into an online course, you can really have something nice and then go from there. And if you have something that people really like to buy, then you might find that you've got yourself not only a little bit of an extra money maker, but something that could be a full-on career later on down the road. Number six, and finally, create an online guide. Now, this one can be, again, active or passive. Uh, I know a lot I've seen uh, in my research where people will sell online guides on how to do things through eBay. And this is not quite the same as an online course. An online course is usually several videos or uh, most of the time the courses nowadays are at least audio or video. But an online guide is written. It's documentation. It's basically a user's guide for whatever you have expertise in and you can send it as a PDF file or whatever. Most of the time you would want to send it as a PDF file and you can sell them on eBay. When eBay first started, there were a lot of online guides that people would actually print out and send it in a folder, and just like a manual that people could hold in their hands, and that's maybe something you could offer, but online guides might be a way to go if you want to, you know, you're you're saying, I don't really have the chops to do an ebook. I don't feel like a writer, but I do know enough to put down how to do something in a step-by-step form that might be the way to go for you would be the online guides. So those are six ways that you can make a little extra income if you want to put the work into it. Like I said at the beginning, you're going to have to put some work into no matter what. And even if it's a passive income, there's always marketing. So, you know, your product may be done and you may be able to sit back, but it's not going to sell itself. So, I do hesitate to use the word passive in a way that makes it sound like it is completely and fully passive, that you'll have to do nothing, that you can just sit back, watch the money roll in, and not do a thing. Usually that's not the case. Sometimes people will hit on something that is so popular it sells itself, but most of the time you have to do some selling. You have to do marketing. You have to get it in front of people because here's the thing. Nothing sells really unless somebody sees it. 
most of the time, you've got to, even if you don't have to convince somebody to buy it, they at least have to know it exists. In my business with etching, one of the biggest obstacles that I find with monument companies when I'm trying to pick up a new monument company and I start telling them what I do and they don't really understand a whole lot and they say, we really don't have a call for it. And I'll ask them, well, do you ever tell them about it? Well, no, because I don't really know anything about it. Well, how do you expect to have a call for etching if you don't tell your customers that it exists? It's kind of the same thing. And then usually once my customers tell their customers that etching exists, I start getting orders because people do like it. And they'll buy it. And it's expensive, but they'll buy it anyway because they like it. And the truth behind most of this stuff is most people underprice the stuff that they sell. They're afraid of giving people price burnout so that they don't, they don't really want to buy the product because they think it's too expensive. And usually that's not the case. As a matter of fact, most of the research that I have found is the lower priced stuff sells less because people associate a lower price with a cheap product. They want a better product. They assume they're going to have to pay a better price. So when you give a better price, you're telling them my product is quality. So the advice I will give you in all of this stuff, if you decide that you do want to do some of it, is make sure you spend the time to research it, do your homework, whatever product or service you're going to offer. Make sure it's quality. Make sure that you give the best customer service that can be given. And make sure that you know what you're talking about and that you are giving a quality product. That's really the best advice I can give you. So, I have it's only been a few days since I recorded the last episode, num episode number 39. I recorded it on a Sunday morning and I'm just now uh, popping back in the car on my way to Cookville, Tennessee this morning to head to do two or three days worth of work and I wanted to go ahead and get this episode recorded so that I wouldn't be behind the eight ball because last week's episode was delivered late. It was delivered on Monday afternoon and it was supposed to have been delivered the previous Friday. So I want to release this one on time and I went ahead and uh, got everything ready for this episode but there's not been a lot that's changed during the week. There's not been a lot that's happened that I didn't tell you about already as far as my life went in episode 39. There are a couple of things, though, that I found interesting, and they all happened yesterday. First of all, I've been wanting for a while, and, and this is another income stream that I'm planning to do, although I don't expect that I'll be able to make it passive. It will definitely have to be, I think, active. Well, I know it will have to be active because of the way I do it, but I've wanted to paint on my old jeans. Now, I'm not wanting to do the painted jeans as a fashion thing. What happens is because of what I do for work, I go through a lot of jeans. I wear them out. And the fronts of them will just be really dingy from me rubbing my hands on them and getting paint and stuff on them. But the back of the jeans, the legs on the back and stuff, will usually, and maybe down at the bottoms from the knee down, will be you know, worn but look fine. Just worn denim. And I usually will give them away to a Goodwill store when they get too ratty. But lately I've decided, you know, I didn't want to give those to a Goodwill store because they're so ratty. I wear them out so fully that they're really not worth giving to a, even a, a Goodwill or a thrift store. And it hit me one day that instead of just throwing them away like I've been doing, I could cut the legs off and kind of fillet them out, you know, cut the seams so that they all lay out flat and paint on them or do some pen and ink on them. Something interesting. Use it because denim's kind of like a similar texture to canvas. Use them like a canvas and I have thought maybe I could try that and see what I could do with it. Well, yesterday I had a little time and I was deciding that I want to try to create some some more income, some things that I can do that I do enjoy with my art, and I decided I had a pair of jeans laying on the table for this, and they've been sitting there for weeks. I decided to give it a try, so I cut them up, and I've had a lot of fun with it. I started with magic markers. I was thinking that I was going to do some kind of bless this house or 
as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord, types of little crafty things with it. And as I was doing it, I just wasn't feeling it. I was like, do I want to start doing this and selling them and get a bunch of orders where I have to do all of this lettering? I really don't know if I want to do that. That's just really not fun for me. I want to be creative. I want to paint on them. So I got out my acrylic paints, my little craft acrylic paints that I have in bottles that most artists end up collecting and not using a whole lot because they're really not worth much for anything other than crafts. But I find that they are really good on denim. And so I started painting and I painted one of my designs, which is uh, the three crosses of Calvary. And that turned out okay. I mean, I guess for most people, they would love it. Most of the people, I put it on Facebook and my Everything Arts group and everybody went, you know, that they liked it and said they loved it. But it really wasn't what I was looking for. I wanted real art. I really wanted something that was frameable. My wife wants to frame that one. I, I guess I'm going to. But I decided to do a rose uh, the next time. And so I spent the second half of the afternoon painting this rose on there, and it turned out really good. So I think I'm going to do a little bit of that just kind of in my free time on days when I'm home and I don't have layouts to do, but I want to be doing something that will make money. That's a good thing to do, and I'll just sell them as art, you know, original paintings just on denim instead of canvas. Now, I'm going to have to figure out a way to mount them. I don't think people are going to want to... They may want to mount them themselves, and I'm not sure which would do better. Uh, I think I'm going to do a survey with my artist friends and with people on my regular Facebook page and see if they were going to buy something like this, would they rather it be already framed or would they rather just buy it so that they had the option of framing it or mounting it in whatever fashion they wanted to. Denim's difficult. I'm not sure exactly how it's going to do without looking tacky, so I'm, I'm going to have to figure that out. But anyway, it's going it's to be a neat little project to make a little extra money because I think I can sell them for anywhere from $50 to $100 a piece and because they are uh, original paintings and make a little extra money. So we'll see. We'll see from that. And then also yesterday I had a or I had an appointment with the doctor because my blood pressure, every time I've gone to the doctor, you know, they always take your blood pressure no matter what you're in for. And every single time it's been high. And the last time I went, when I was seeing my skin specialist, they were so concerned. They almost told me they couldn't do the procedure for me because my blood pressure was so high. They said, there's a point where we are not allowed to do any procedures on you if your blood pressure is over a certain point and yours is over that. So she made me wait about five minutes and then took it again and it had fallen to just below it. She said, okay, I can officially do it now, but you need to have this seen about. So I made an appointment and yesterday I went and it was really, really high. It was like 157 over something, I'm not sure, but it, it was really high. And so I've now, I'm going to be taking a, a water pill. He said, we're going to start in that direction. It usually works pretty good. And he said, uh, everything looks pretty good. I'm losing weight, so I'm, I'm doing the right thing as far as trying to, you know, get my weight down. He's just told me to make sure I continue exercising every day and I need to eat a healthy diet. You know, cut the salt. Uh, you know, it's okay to have salt. Just make sure I don't go over what I really should have daily. And... So that's going to be a new change in my life. I'm going to really try to do this. I don't want to have a stroke. They say that the danger of high blood pressure isn't as much heart attack like a lot of people think as it is stroke. And I don't want that. I've seen people that have had strokes. And if I can avoid it, I, I would like to avoid it. So that's what's happened to me in the last couple of days, I suppose, in episode 41, which I'm probably going to hopefully try to record on the way back from Cookville either tomorrow afternoon or Friday, maybe something interesting would have happened. I'm going to try to get a little bit of a head of the game here, but that's what I've got as far as what has happened to me since the last time I recorded. And today's positive review is going to be Cafe Press. Cafe Press is one of the companies that I have used for passive income. This is along the artistic line, but you don't have to be an artist. Cafe Press is a company that you can sign up for. You can have free shops or you can have a premium shop. They say that the best money is made after you uh, pay a monthly 
quarterly or yearly fee for the premium shop, obviously, because you have more tools at your disposal and more of their marketing. But you can have a free shop, and you can have as many free shops as you want. There are limitations, but you can have them. And I have made a little money. And when I say a little money, I mean a little money. I mean like $50 a year is about what I make through Cafe Press. And the Alabama image that I told you about earlier that I was a little worried about, I put that image on a bunch of products that they have, and they sell it there. They drop ship it. You don't have to do anything. It's completely passive once you are done. The thing about Cafe Press is you do, to make real money, you need to stay on top of it. And again, the more you have in your catalog, the more likely you are to be found, and the more likely you are to make sales. Their prices are high to start with but people do use them and they have been around for a while and are still relevant so you can make money with it there are things you need to do though I would suggest doing some research find some uh, articles I found a couple of good articles on how to make money on cafe press by people who have done it and the tips and tricks that they use and I'm planning on doing a little bit more of that I think I said that in one of my earlier episodes too and I never really got to it but I think I'm gonna spend one night a week focusing on cafe press and trying to improve my shops and I'm thinking about going ahead for myself and getting the premium membership to see if that makes any difference in my sales because I think there's something I can do I just need to focus it and niche it down a little bit more but it is a positive thing although I I don't really care that they make so much versus how much I make you make like 10 percent and it's not much at all I mean I will make 10 cents on one of their sales you know it's not much but if you do it right I think you can have enough volume where you can make a little extra money you're not gonna get rich I doubt you're ever gonna get rich doing cafe press I'm not gonna say you won't I'm just saying I doubt you will but there are people who make a little bit so it's something for you to look into, and it is a positive thing. So check out CafePress.com, and that's this week's positive review. If you've got something you'd like to add to this, if you have a, an active or passive income stream that people might would be interested in that they can do from their home that I didn't mention, please comment. Leave me some feedback. Let us know, and I'll mention it in the podcast and add it to one of the episodes as an addendum to this one. And Or if you have anything else that you'd like to talk to me about or let me know or get in touch with me for any reason, here's how you do it. It's feedback at michaelblackston.com. That's the email address, feedback at michaelblackston.com. You can also reach me via the voicemail line at 706-408-7456. You can also comment on michaelblackston.com, and you can comment at roadnoisepodcast.com, and that's where I'd really like you to go to share this podcast, let other people know about it. Please hit the share buttons on the social media below each episode. You have that option, and you can just share it straight to your Facebook page if you found it interesting at all or something you'd like to let other people know about. I really would love for you to do that. And you can also leave feedback on iTunes through the roadnoisepodcast.com webpage. There's a button up at the top where you can hit iTunes and go to the iTunes page that I have there and you're able to leave feedback on iTunes and I'd really love you to do that because that helps me to be found by other people and it helps me rank there. I'm coming into Chattanooga now so traffic's getting tight and it's time to end the podcast and get this microphone out of my hand. It'll be a lot easier when I have the headset. But until then, thank you for spending your time with me, sitting alongside me in the passenger seat as we commute and learn to live life one mile at a time. I'm Michael Blackston. Until next time, bye-bye.